You're listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author Sarah Box, where you get the inside scoop on the steps action takers and decision makers take to align their purpose to their principles and achieve their goals in business and life. We focus on the mantra, no labels, no limits, no excuses. And now, without further ado, please welcome your commanding coach with plenty of chutzpah and heart, Sarah Box. Hi there, everyone. This is Sarah, your host of the No Labels, No Limits podcast, a podcast all about shedding our limiting labels and beliefs so we can live our dreams and shine our lights into the world. This week, we are joined by Jen Whitmer. Now, Jen describes herself, this cracks me up, as a recovering conflict avoider who used to moonwalk out of hard conversations. I love the visual and I can uh, relate to the feeling. She now says though that our success rises and falls with our ability to manage conflict. And today Jen speaks, writes and coaches about hard topics with her infectious joy. And you're gonna get to meet her and feel that energy. And it is that energy and her joy, but also her ability to ask those big questions plus the power of self-awareness through the Enneagram that make up Jen's secret sauce in helping teams and leaders solve conflict and personality clashes. And those changes impact our leadership and every other relationship we have. Um, A very cool thing I asked before we came on what she's reading, and she's reading Choose Your Story, Change Your Life, The Whole Person, Workplace, and This Song Will Save Your Life. So one thing you know about Jen, she is not a single option woman. She (laughs) gets her words in. So, but today I am going to ask Jen to share more about how conflict is experienced by the different Enneagram types, um, what each type needs to resolve conflict, and examples of the steps we can take to create peace from conflict. And as someone who has not always dealt the most professionally or peacefully with conflict, I am eager to learn more. So with that, let's welcome our guest, Jen Whitmer. Hi, Jen. Hi, what an amazing introduction. Thank you so much. (laughs) It was really hard to figure out what I wanted to say, because there's so much more I could have said. But there are, (laughs) um, there are many threads I would pull on the fabric that is your bio. So (laughs) we'll get into that in a little bit. But I ask all of our guests this question, and that is whether there is something that you do every day, Jen, that keeps you living true to your own purpose, your own calling. Mm, What a fantastic question. I think I have developed the habit over time. Um, (laughs) Like this has not been a, a new thing, but I've developed the habit over time of having a few moments of silence every day, which for me is a huge discipline. (laughs) So, but what that, those moments of silence, it allows for me, the anxieties that I keep at bay, um, the what ifs, like all of that with exciting action, helping other people, all that kind of stuff. Um, Those moments of silence, let the, let the anxiety kind of bubble up and out. So they're, they're, and I can remember, oh, this isn't about me. This is about me helping people. This is about me helping make the wrong things right in the world that lead to human flourishing. Like all of that is the work that I do. Um, And if I'm ignoring the anxieties, I start to spin a little bit and I don't know why. So those moments of silence are really helpful to me. I get it. I do. And and developing it over time also. Um, okay. What I didn't share with folks is that you begin your journey at Oxford with music. So I want to know, how do you get from Oxford to the Enneagram? What is the story oh. there? Okay. So I should say that I spent two terms in Oxford. I did not do my entire undergraduate work there. Um, but yeah, I was studying music and music history and I was a music teacher and, um, always an Anglophile. So loved being in England, living there. Oxford is one of my favorite cities on the planet. Um, And I loved being a music teacher. I loved the history of music because I love stories. And I love how stories express themselves through art that we get to participate in today. Like 
some people don't know that Bach has 26 children. How does somebody with 26 children write so much work? Like, how do you be that prolific? Like, what is that about? And I get to connect with that through this beautiful work of art is amazing. So one of the things that hasn't changed is my love of stories and people. And so after I was a music teacher, I had uh, three kids in three years. I I had another one. And then I went back to work as an administrator in my children's private school. So I was um, had this dream job that I loved in this school that we had a leadership shift that changed everything. And really, conflict was the surface symptom of a lack of self-awareness and skill on our leadership. And it was devastating it was devastating and we as a team just couldn't like what is going on and it started to impact all kinds of areas of our life and so I left and it was a really challenging time because I was actually fired but then stayed on for this weird role it was all kinds of difficulty but in that time I started really digging in like what's my role here what is what am I contributing to this difficulty and what do I need to know about conflict because like I said I will moonwalk my way out of a conflict and usually some kind of song and dance so everybody's like hey aren't we laughing now it's great um I didn't know that I was a conflict avoider by covering it up with oh it's fine because at least this is going to happen I didn't know that was a form of conflict avoidance and as I studied I went back to school because again I was an educator that's what we do and uh, so I went back to school and studied and really dug into culture to communication and conflict resolution and during that time of professional study I was personally studying the Enneagram and I was like man this has the depth of the Enneagram as a personality framework changed how I saw these surface level actions of conflict resolution of cultural differences of how we communicate and I could see throughout different cultures the Enneagram applying because it's about what we're motivated by and so with those two things together I started really seeing if I could help people and use my gift of teaching and making these kind of heavy things lighter because they're so scary and they're so big and nobody wants to talk about it. If I can use those gifts and help people really solve conflict, that's the surface, but really figure out how to manage different personalities. I can really do so much good in a way that people wouldn't have to experience what I did. And I could really help leaders because a lot of times they just are unskilled. And then when we're unskilled, we get insecure, when we get insecure, we get defensive and when we get defensive, we, we tend to hurt people. And so if I could help people not get into that spot, that's a really exciting thing to do with my life. So yeah, that's that my story. That's a pretty story, right? The getting hurt, <laughs> getting defensive, hurting people, not the story you want to write mm -mm. or be in. No, no. Yep. And that you know, I know that it turned for the better, but having to leave under those conditions, especially when you said it was a great job and you had a good mm -hmm. team. And I mean, that must have been heartbreaking on some level. Um, not on some level. Um, on on all every level. On all the levels. Aww. It was. And when, and lots of people have identity jobs, but teaching is an identity job. And um, I was an educator. That's what I did and to lose that like I didn't know how to introduce myself it was that simple it was like somebody when I left I started consulting with another company and was helping them basically train on writing because one of the things I did was help teachers train about writing again storytelling and I was you know I didn't know how to introduce myself as that like I didn't I literally didn't know the words to say because I was as an identity and educator so at my very core it just was destructive um in a way that really beautifully got rebuilt i would rather have not had had that happen <laughs> but i am grateful for the outcome well and had it not happened you might not be here today doing what you're doing right yeah, thinking absolutely. about the people who wouldn't get your benefit benefit mm -hmm. of what you've learned and grown from what when you started learning about the enneagram in yourself what was one of your first personal aha moments um <laughs> well i have to admit I was first introduced to the Enneagram in college. So as a freshman, I was studying in this a leadership program and we were doing the Myers-Briggs and one of the other faculty members at our school was like, you really should check out the Enneagram. And he gave us this like grid 
and it had like a mimeograph. It was like a mimeographed sheet that had been copied for those of you who are old enough to remember what mimeographs are. <laughs> like it was this weird purple dot matrix thing. And it was like, had these big scary words like lust and gluttony <laughs> and deceit. And I was like, I can't even cope with that. I'm going to head back over here to my really fun Myers-Briggs and learn so much. Um, and I did. <laughs> so 20 years later, in the midst of this really challenging, horrible, um, toxic environment, one of the people that I worked with said, this is why I think the Enneagram is so helpful. Because I'd been using Myers-Briggs as an educator and a teacher and a faculty leader. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. Because here's what I remember about it. But I was just in a place where I'm like, yeah, this is not working. I got to find something else what it is. And so it was really helpful to have this aha of, oh, if I'm one of these two types, three types, I was kind of deciding it doesn't matter which one of these I am, I would still have been in conflict with this leader. And so some of this is not necessarily anyone's fault. But what exacerbated the issue was the lack of skill between us and not really understanding how to work through this conflict. So that was like, oh, OK, we all see differently. Like I knew that logically that we see differently and I'd done Myers-Briggs work. So I knew that we saw differently, but at a core level that I am literally motivated for a different reason. It changed how I started to approach to, to approach some things and was really freeing for me because I also got to see where I was healthy and where I was unhealthy and I could fix my part and then oh wait that isn't solving this problem I'm getting healthy and the other person is not and it was really challenging and so those were some of the big ahas at the beginning like oh okay we really see the world differently now what do we do <laughs> Well, and I think for folks who've been in just even thinking about it from a professional experience, I, that is common. It's oh. really common, right? Because we're quote unquote hired or we have a team or whatever to get something accomplished. Mm -hmm. And so in our heads, we think we have a picture of how we can do that and what we need, you know, to do that in the best way, because of course our way of seeing the world is, isn't everybody see it that way. <laughs> so, I mean, I do think that that's the first aha. It's like I can make these changes in me, but beyond that, I can't force somebody to be different, but I could understand them better mm -hmm. and perhaps use language and don't do other things that won't, that will automatically like rack up the tension. Exactly. And then you could, I could really see personally, like I'm using this, I'm starting to apply it to my own life, which is always the best for, for anything y'all learn folks, learn applying it to your own life first, but particularly the Enneagram. And I was starting to see my ability to change, which started to change how I was communicating with my husband and my kids and my friends. And these things were starting to go so much smoother. It started to be show shine a real light that actually this leader wasn't healthy and I got I had more compassion for them at that point even but it helped me set some boundaries like it just led the path to health in a way that I don't think I could have anticipated because I was a pretty good communicator before then but I it changed everything when I understood the motivation piece of it what number do you know what number your leader was I don't um, what would have been your best guess? Given my best you guess, we go back and forth as you know, you 20 hindsight is 2020. And I never love to like type other people. So I understand you know, that. Um, so the caveat is there is somewhere in there on the three, six, nine train somewhere in, in that aspect. And I think either a really unhealthy three or a really unhealthy nine. And it's so hard to tell where people are when they are in their own struggles and trauma. Sure. Because That's as a seven, best. at a seven, I went full on into super stressful one. I had to figure out how to, oh, I guess I have to just do this and this and this and this and manage this process. And that didn't work super well either. It helped get some stuff done, but not <laughs> you know, help all the things. So I think the it was a, a really challenging piece of learning. I think I'd say it that way. It was a really difficult way to learn something, but something that I don't have to relearn. Like I'm, I'm not going back to that place again. 
one and done with that. <laughs> yes, yes, and thank you. <laughs> I think about that time going, that was a great lesson. I'm not forgetting that lesson because nope. I'm not doing it twice. Nope. So um, I wanted to ask you, you know, what do you mean by mismatch? So we talk about unhealthy conflict and we're mm -hmm. going to come back to that. But you also use the term mismanaged conflict. Mm -hmm. Can you dissect the two so that we're, I'm not inadvertently applying the wrong terminology? Yeah. So I think we have conflict that is mishandled it is a couple different categories. When conflict is mishandled, often we assume it's somebody else's fault. So if I don't have the responsibility to do anything, then I can't fix it because it's someone else's fault. So then if I'm the leader and I think this is someone else's responsibility, I then don't step in to help solve, to help create options, to help bring connection. I don't do the steps because I have this idea that it's someone else's job. Um, and I think as leaders, we can often get really tired because conflict is common. Um, and if we don't know how to manage it, we mishandle it because we think, well, that's their problem. They got to figure it out. When often conflict requires somebody else to help them figure it out or a process, because there's process conflict, there's systems conflict, there's personal conflict. And if you're mishandling a process and really it's a personal issue, you're going to apply the wrong solution to the problem. So I think those are different ways we mishandle conflict. And, a, and this is, let me test and see if this is common for you as well. But oftentimes when I'm asked to work with an organization on planning or something else, right, the issue they'll say is a process issue. We need to fix this process. But as you have a conversation, you learn they want me as the consultant or coach to fix a person. Mm -hmm. It is not a process issue, which are easy, right? Those are technical fixes, easy peasy, diagnose, fix, you're on your way, but personal lines, right? So it's again, that sidestepping piece. What do you do with that, Jen, when, it, when you find yourself in a situation like that? Yeah. So one of the things that I do like to look at process first, because sometimes things are getting blown out of proportion because of a bad process. Um, so like, it's always important to look at your process. That's never something you should just assume is fine <laughs> um, because those little frustrations can really add up. I think when we're talking about a, fixing a person, I never love that language. I mean, I know you're not talking about it that way, but people often like, can't you just fix them? That's and a common request though, behind the scenes when you're one-on-one -on -one with totally. a leader, it's like, this is my problem. Can you make it better? Can you, yeah. so, it's common. I, it's just it not is public. It's so common. It's so common. I'm not denying that. And I think, but when we have this idea that someone needs to be fixed rather than understand why they're doing that, that's the question. So what's the reasoning behind their actions? Yep. That's where we have to dig in. So my, um, bless her, my 12 year old is, um, somebody, she just kind of roams in circles. Like, and it, it's not that she's disobedient. She's not a rebellious kid. She's actually seemingly very compliant. Um, but she goes away and then does not do the thing. And if you were not thinking what is happening for her, what is causing this problem as a parent, you know, if she, obviously employers are not parents, but the similar idea of like, can't you just do this? How do I get you to fix it? So rather than <laughs> what I've discovered is that I have asked her what happens when you say yes, and then you walk away and don't do it. She's like, I honestly just forget. I get distracted by this, that, or the other. And so what we've worked out is I need you to do this now, or I need you to do this in five minutes. And that has helped her change. She doesn't walk away and get distracted. Now, if I were just continue, like, just get your stuff done. Like, why can't this person send their emails on time? Why can't this person, you know, talk to a client better? Like we get these, like, <laughs> like, why can't they just is never a good start to a question. And then, so I'm always trying to help people lean into the curiosity. What are the reasons this behavior is coming up? 
And when we think about what are the reasons this behavior is coming up, first of all, it separates the emotion a little bit. We can have a little benevolent detachment. And then we move into solution providing, which is all conflict is. Conflict is solutions. Uh, and so it's, those are the things when we walk into a situation and we're like, how do we fix this person? How can't they just step back and like, what are the reasons this is happening for them? You know, like emails on time. Do they have, do they not have a good email tracking system? I mean, I get overloaded with emails, but I have my system, you know, like I figured it out. Maybe that's what they need help with. And it's very simple, but we don't know that until we ask that question. That curiosity, when you talk about having that curiosity, that is such a powerful approach, period, right? Is just mm -hmm. to never assume you know. Absolutely. And just go, it's that whole thing like beginner's mind, even if I've known mm -hmm. you for years. And it's hard. Like I think about you used that you said that your relationships with your husband, your kids, all those started to improve when you started working on you, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing here. It's more like, oh, so I don't actually know. <laughs> what's going on in here? What's motivating? What happened 10 minutes before I walked in the room? None of that. So if you just start and go, I wonder what's really happening here. What happened when? Right. I love that approach because it, it does a couple of things. Like you said, it keeps, it separates us, but it also allows that person to be who they are without having to get defensive. Yes. Yeah. And, and I, I think it gets us to be specific. If we're going to help people um, in conflict or just in leadership, feedback always has to be specific. You have a vibe is never helpful and often offensive, <laughs> you know, but when you do A, I respond with B or I feel this, like it's a specific behavior we're addressing that changes like, oh, I can, oh, I didn't know that we can do this. And, <laughs> uh, you know, that changes how we communicate with people. Specificity is just incredibly important when we're giving feedback and trying to connect with other people. And even the simple things like I know um, people say, well, I emailed them, right? I'm thinking, are they an email person? And they go, I don't know. And I said, they might be a text person. Why don't you ask them, like, call, asks, what's your preferred method of getting info? It's mm -hmm. a simple question because then they'll pay attention to you. But, I mean, we, we assume, like, I like it this way, doesn't everybody? So I think that's great. Will you um, talk about a little bit about how conflict is different. We talked about your approach and a little bit about the types, but if, can you go around and go, okay, this type in case someone's listening and they know their type and they're going, oh yeah, <laughs> conflict, but like how, how do the types experience it? And then um, maybe a little bit about what that type needs to mm -hmm. move forward. So they're not stuck. Yeah. So before I jump and go around the circle of the Enneagram, I want to give a basic definition of interpersonal conflict um, that I like to use. This is, you know, this is, the, this is the definition I use. Conflict is when we have limited resources and differing goals. So if you experience limited resources, which are almost always going to fall into the buckets of time, money, people, and space, time, money, people, and space, limited resources, and differing goals, which is our different Enneagram motivations. If we, <laughs> that's when we have the opportunity to have some conflict. And, and sometimes that conflict is a fire that explodes, and sometimes it is a solution we provide. And I'm always trying to get people to the solution we provide. So when you're thinking about conflict, that's what I want you to have in your head. It's limited resources and differing goals. In that process, of course, people get their feelings hurt. All of that is real. But if we can bring it back to that definition, it really helps us like solve problems. So when I think about Enneagram eights, Enneagram eights fall into what I call the dynamite category. Eights, fours, and sixes fall into this like dynamite. They're gonna just come at it. Like we're, we're ready to go. And they connect to the problem emotionally, which is kind of funny for an eight who thinks, you know, they're kind of emotion um, repressed, as we like to say, or unproductive. Um, but really, this is where their passion and their anger, because they're fine with those two. And so that's where it really comes out. And the thing that eights, if you are 
in a conflict with an eight, the hardest thing is to remember is they want you to match them. Like, cause you're like, okay, whatever, whatever. And they're, that will probably annoy them more. And I think that's really challenging to remember. Match in energy, match in energy, like yeah, stand up for yourself. If they're frustrated, you standing up calmly, but holding your ground is really important. The thing that is going to set an eight off is they feel like you are controlling them. That will really set an eight off. So you standing your ground and letting them have theirs is the tricky part about conflict with an eight. And so they don't want to be betrayed. They don't want to be hurt. They don't want to be controlled. So if they're experiencing that, if you're an eight, like you're like, totally, I don't want those things. I'm the warrior. I'm not going to show weakness. I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> you know, like it's right or wrong. And my opinion is right. And here we go. You know, that's kind of an eights posture. And so for eights to remember that vulnerability is actually a strength is a really key thing for eights to remember. Um, another thing I think is just a super practical tip for eights is assume people are doing the best they can. Eights tend to assume that everybody can be doing more and and that they're just not getting it and they they just need to step up and have the same level of energy and output that an eight does so for an eight to assume that people are doing the best that they can can really help them bring down the emotion to start to see problems um and the last thing for an eight is i really eights love black and white Lots of people do. I mean, not, they're not the only number, but eights really, really love a black and white. And so becoming more comfortable with gray, becoming more comfortable with other people have to get through their emotions before the conflict can be solved. Those are important things for eights to remember. So just let me test eights not want to eights, given what you just said, aren't going to want someone who won't share their thoughts and opinions, but are they willing to wade through the emotional processes of the other person, or do they want that person to come and say, this is what I think? They prefer that this is what, actually, this is what we're doing. Okay. <laughs> like, here's what we're going to do. Get into here's action. Think about that. They're ready for action. So for the eight to be patient with people sharing their emotions is what the eight has to change. Okay. So, but if you are the person who has the emotions, you need to stand up and say, before we can move to action, I have to process through it in this way. And if you can hold that ground, eights tend to be because inside they're just these gushy teddy bears they really really are and so if you can get that to them and they don't feel like you're trying to use your emotions to control them that's really an important piece there but sharing and owning your own stuff emotions thoughts and actions is really important to an eight fabulous so then I like to start with the eights. I forgot to say that. Um, and then we move to the nines and nines fall into what I call the um the silver linings group. <laughs> so nines are the classic conflict avoiders of the Enneagram. They're going to merge with your idea just to avoid the conflict. They genuinely see all sides of the issue. Like they're not making that up. They really can see that, oh, you think A and you think B and you think purple. I can see all of those things, even though somebody else were like, they don't even make any sense. Nines genuinely can see all of that. And so they go with the flow and they genuinely see all sides of the story. The, the part that trips them up is they want to keep the peace, but they're very lazy peacemakers. Like, we're just going to keep everything calm and smooth, but peacemaking is, is really active work. And that's a challenge for a nine. So if you're a nine that is listening and you're like, I'm just a peacekeeper. I just want, I want everybody to be happy. You do. <laughs> and what that does is it can create more conflict because you're not actually addressing a root problem. And that's tricky for a nine. If you are a nine, I, the suggestion I really have for you is to remind yourself that your engagement matters. You might have to get still and quiet to know what you really think after you've heard A, B, and purple. <laughs> you might have to really get quiet, but then know that that's an important part of the conversation. And I think the other thing for nines to remember is to communicate their thoughts when they're asked. Sometimes nines we think they're agreeing with us because they're kind of saying, uh-huh. Oh, uh-huh. And, but they're not, they're not necessarily agreeing. They're just participating in the verbal aspect of a conversation. And so really communicate if you feel differently. And that's the scary part 
But knowing that your engagement matters and being willing to communicate that is really important. If you are in a conflict with a nine, you're not the nine, give them some time. Let's so like when if you ask me my thought on something, I'll probably jump in in about two two 2.2 seconds with an idea and like, oh, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. A nine is going to need a moment. So give them more wait time encourage them to speak up if even outside of a conflict like hey i'm going to want to talk to you about this later i'd love for you to think about it so we can have a conversation about that now that might make them internally nervous because they're like ah. but if you've given them the specific topic and then the time to consider it that's that's helpful for them to get their thoughts out well it doesn't make them feel like they just got pushed back on their heels Exactly. Either, right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's not an ambush. It's not. Yes. Yes. And the nines have to do work too. Like we can all, we all work together. We've got our work to do. So Enneagram ones, as we go around the circle, I like to put Enneagram ones in what I call the cool cucumber group. They are really looking for ones really love the rules and the framework and the policy, you know, like the per my last email kind of like, or it's in your policy manual ones love that. And it's fantastic for the rest of us. We've already made that decision. Actually, the policy answers this question, which is great, <laughs> but they can run into trouble because they, uh, much like eights, kind of like my opinion is the way forward, um, but it's they don't feel as much as their opinion because they want to be in alignment with whatever the rule says. And so, but that's what the rule says and, and that's what's good. And that's what gives me comfort. So if we're going outside of that, it makes me feel very insecure. And so know that when you're in a conflict with a one, they're going to like refer back to the rule, whether that rule is published or not, <laughs> like it's an unspoken rule. Um, they're going to refer back to that because that's where they go. And so they repress this anger because they feel like this situation is bad. And so they're going to try to like, well, here's what the rule is. So here's what we're going to do. And now we're done because they're going to try to get through that conflict really fast. And because what they want is to feel good. Like I, I did the right thing. We did the right thing. And they can get very confused when other people don't care about doing the right thing. <laughs> they're like wait a second what do you mean you don't because they think it can always be better and that can be draining for other people who are like can't we just rest for a moment um so for ones i would love for you to remember that idea of of what is mine to do this is also really important for twos but for ones like to accept the things i cannot control <laughs> that that serenity of I this is outside of my control or it, that can be really calming and peaceful in a conflict like I don't actually have to make you good you know like I don't I don't have to make that happen for you and also to really accept the beauty of imperfection and that imperfection is very challenging for a one but that it also creates different opportunities and and new ideas that may even be better that help you get to what you always want which is to make things better and that can be challenging for the one if you are in a conflict with a one ones take criticism very deeply so i always suggest phrasing it with i statements of i feel this when this happens i feel this and would you consider doing this so when you leave the toaster out on the counter, I feel that one would never leave the toaster out on the counter. That's a terrible example. <laughs> but <Hello? yeah. laughs> when you get frustrated, when I see that you're frustrated because I didn't put the trash away correctly, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. Would you consider letting me know in a different way that the trash isn't put away? Something I'm clearly making up an example, but that owning it and not making them feel like or not criticizing them like you always tell me I'm doing it wrong. That's not going to get you anywhere, but owning it for yourself and then asking, would you consider a different action? Ones are very into com competency. Yes, they will consider a different action. Um, and I think that's a way forward with ones. That was great. <laughs> I would fail your toaster test. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's funny. I'm the one that puts the toaster away in our house. That's why I always use that example. 
Um, for twos, twos fall into that same category as nine, the silver linings group. Um, and they are wanting to solve the problem quickly. So everybody feels really good because they feel the discomfort of the conflict. And so they just want everything to feel good. So they're going to give a lot of options or cop out and be like, fine. And like, just it, it's fine. I'm just going to avoid that. Um, the great thing about twos is they tend to see lots of novel soup. Uh, novel situations, novel solutions for things, but they can be really temperamental in a conflict as soon as they feel like their solutions are unappreciated. And so if you're in the conflict and they've offered solutions and you just dismiss them out of hand, then you're going to run into some troubles with the two. And do they just quit offering solutions and they just back off? Is that often, not every two, but often that's where they're like, fine. And they might move to that position of eight where they get really angry uh that can that can be what's happened or they can kind of sulk a little and be like fine fine sure you know like it's very can be very passive aggressive um it it depends but it often that trigger is that you didn't appreciate what i was trying to contribute here i was trying to jump to your rescue i was trying to provide solutions and you didn't appreciate that and that that can be the that's the crux of the issue for them so they're trying to make it all so everybody feels good because like oh well at least you know that kind of feeling and so what i want twos to always remember is a slightly different question than ones but that what is mine to do suzanne stabile talks about that question and i think it's so powerful for twos what is mine to do do i have to solve this problem for them did they ask me for this solution and and really humbly wait to provide the options that can be really challenging for the two but that work and then the other one for twos forever is boundaries 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 and more boundaries (laughs) those really help in conflict like this isn't actually i don't have to get caught up in your emotional struggle which is what a two does. They're like, I'm going to connect with you emotionally, which is what we love about them. But also it's what can cause them problems. And so if you're working with a two, um, passive aggressive return to passive aggressive does not help anybody. So it's not like, well, they're doing that. I'm going to do that. Um, Try to keep them really open and appreciate the solution. Like I can see why you suggested that. Here's what I'm concerned about and why I think that might not be the best for us take the time to add the extra words they love the niceties they love that like they feel connected and as long as you're staying connected and you're solving through it they'll stay with it um and you can stay with the two in the discussion okay all right here we go threes threes are much like ones they're in this competency group this like cool cucumber and they um in a conflict, they get very image focused and conflict feels like failure. And so threes also want to rush through it pretty quickly. And so they're going to like, okay, how do we get to the goal? Whatever my emotions are, I don't care. Whatever your emotions are, I don't care. How are we getting to the goal? (laughs) And the goal is to get this conflict over. And uh, the hard thing for threes is that they're seeing things with their emotions, but they're not using the emotions to help them solve the problem. And all a little more about that so to see with their emotions but not using them yeah that so they're can be like, a little tricky it is so like here's this emotion I, i'm seeing it in the room but you know what i'm going to put it over here in this box and i'm going to process that later i'm not going to worry about that now i'm going to look for the facts i'm going to look for the action steps and that's what i'm going to focus on i'm not going to use these emotions to help make this decision and where that is a problem <laughs> is all decisions are emotional decisions and you're making decisions all the time in a conflict because you're trying to find a solution so for threes that's really challenging because they're like these emotions are getting in the way of getting to the goal and i don't feel competent and that's what that cool cucumber cool 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 cucumber group is about and so they want to get to that goal and so they're highly focused on tasks and if like you mess up the tasks that are getting in the goal that can be a problem for the three. So for threes, because this is an image focused thing and I feel like conflict is a failure, letting down the mask of, oh, this is upsetting to me. And here's here's why you still have your data. I'm not saying throughout the data, but allowing the emotions to come in actually helps you get to the solution, which is what you want. And to really know that conflict is not failure. Conflict is inevitable. 
it's going to happen. And so if you can, as a three kind of go, okay, conflict is inevitable. I have skills to get me through this, even though I am upset, you know, like, and just let them self-talk a little bit through that. That's what I want threes to remember. If you're working with a three, be very careful when you are offering a critique because of that achievement focus. That's very challenging for them. Also encourage them to ask them how they feel because they're going to tell you what they think. And then if you ask them how they feel, they're probably going to tell you what they think again in a different way. So stick with it in asking them how they feel and that will help them get to the solution and offering how you feel in a way that isn't um, overly emotional is very helpful. So offering how you feel without being incredibly um, emotive can be a challenge for people, but is really helpful to a three. They like things staying cool, calm, and collected. Um, and the deeper the relationship, the more emotional you can be. I talk a lot about emotions at work. So <laughs> like we're still trying to stay whatever professional means. Um, and that means having some self-regulation to express your emotions without being out of control. So that's really helpful to a three. Okay, so that that's helpful. And the other thing I liked about the three that you said too was understanding the efficient the need for efficiency or the motivation, right? Very much, very much. Um, and we have a lot of threes in the American workforce. We they kind of get elevated. It's just really common. Then we move to fours. And fours are back in that dynamite group with the eights, and they genuinely cannot work through a conflict if they have not expressed their emotions. Now, fours have to learn how to express their emotions like I was just talking about, how to express emotions without being out of control about them. But the, you cannot get through a conflict with a four if you don't allow them to express their emotions because it's not over for them. And if it's not over for one person, it is not over for both people. So and true really, really important. Um, no, we don't all have to feel happy at the end. I'm not saying that, which is really disappointing to me, but <laughs> it does mean we've, we've gotten to a point of closure. Um, they often are worried that somebody else knows how to do this better than them. That So like somebody else can get through this, comp like I'm kind of a mess. They can fall into this self-reflective, why does this always happen to me? Or if you're critiquing their work, it feels like a personal critique. A lot of fours are in creative industries. And if you're working for a, a client and a designer has got this beautiful thing and the client's like, yeah, but I really don't like that color blue. A four can take that really personally and they have to work through that. And so when you're in a conflict with a four, letting them process through their emotions and also offering critiques that feel constructive and not personal is really, really important. Um, one of the struggles that fours have is they send mixed messages. They'll tell you one thing, but their body says something different. So be patient and ask them questions and let them let them come out with the deeper parts of them. So would you ask a reflective question? So mm -hmm. for instance, giving that precise example, like I'm having a conversation with you and you tell me, no, all is good, but I'm looking at your body language. I'm thinking you are nowhere near the line of good. Right? <laughs> But would that set you back if I said, Jen, I know that you say you're good, but I, I just get a sense that something's off. Is there more we should talk about here? I mean, would you go in that direction or is that too much? I would. I think that is a perfect way to ask that question as well, because you're allowing them the out if they don't want to talk about it. But a four always wants to feel seen. And what you just demonstrated is that you see them. I see that it just doesn't totally look like you're great with this. Is there more you want to talk about? And you've opened the door for them to make the choice. It's a beautiful way to ask that question. Well, and in a professional, I would back off. In a personal relationship, I'd go one more go at them if they said I'm fine. <laughs> exactly. And you have to know your audience. I totally. do. Well, because, you know, it's like, okay, we'll come back to this when it feels better yeah. for you. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And that's totally fine as well. People get to set their own boundaries, but keeping that door open is really important. And then for fours to really remember is that sometimes the known solution is a fine solution. Often fours get into conflicts because they want to create a new novel, unique, special thing to make it happen. And 
actually, you know, the dumb way we've been doing it, it's not dumb. It just is, it actually works really well. <laughs> and that can be, that can be challenging for a four. So when you're talking through conflict, like, okay, that is something that it's, it's acceptable. It's fine that it's not something fun um, or unique or special in that way. And just like we talked about giving fours the opportunity to share and feel seen and connected is an important part of conflict resolution with a four. Then we move to the fives. Fives fall into the same cool cucumber competency group with ones and threes. And so they want to make sure that all the data is there. And so if you are if you're a five and somebody just makes a decision and it is has no factual background or strategic background, you're probably going to get frustrated. And so knowing that that happens <laughs> is really important for you. <laughs> yeah. So the other thing that fives do is they can detach from their emotions so much. And what they're doing is like, so I can be competent, so I can be capable, I can um, be not ignorant, you know, like I don't, I want to know, no, no, and think, think, think. And so one of the important aspects for fives is also to bring those emotions in. Like it's okay that our emotions are a part of conflict. Um, actually removing the emotions from conflict doesn't solve it. And I think if fives can like see that as a formula that, oh, emotions are a part of the formula, even though it's the part I'm uncomfortable with, that's okay. It helps them kind of make their mind make sense of it. And the facts are, are so important that that's what they bring to us and the data and often like a relevant piece of data from so long ago, they're like, but here, <laughs> like that can be really helpful for fives. Um, so if you're in a conflict with a five listening to them, like, well, what, what are the reasons you think that they're going to be able to answer that all day long? <clears throat> I think the hard thing for a five is answering the question, well, what do you want to do? What do you want to do to solve this problem? Because they are bringing their observations and their strategies, but they don't always know, oh, I have to have a solution that I'm then going to act on. And so for fives, oftentimes it's asking for the space. Uh, this is, I can't do all of this right now. I need to take 15 minutes to think through it myself and come back. And so the important part for the five is to come back, like set a time limit on it. Like it may be, it's not 15 minutes, maybe it's a day and a half, whatever it is, but give it time. Like I, I do want to think through this and that is caring to the person who is on the other side to say, absolutely. But I am going to check back with you in 15 minutes, like, or I am good, whatever the decided time is, you know, April 15th, we're coming back, you know, and like, we're going to come back and talk about this. That's really, really important. But what that time does is helps the five get in touch with their emotions, see the facts that they want, and then come to a conclusion because they kind of have all these decision trees happening and like, and then they can come with a couple options. Um, but the setting the time to re-engage is really, really important. That's perfect for a five. <laughs> Do you feel seen? <laughs> oh, well, I feel seen. But the other thing is understanding that about, and I, I, honestly, I came to this later in understanding my thought processes. The one question in a conflict that I do not like to be asked because I honestly can't answer it in the moment. I can answer it and come back, like you said, is how do you feel about that? And it's like, mm -hmm. I have no clue how I feel about that. I can tell you what the impact on everybody else in the room is going to be if we do X. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you, I don't like X period because <laughs> it's going to, because it's going to be bad for us as a team. Right. But my solution, I need to think about that. Yeah. But yeah. So that time piece um, is really important. Mm -hmm. It's so valuable for us to consider that conflict isn't one and done. Conflict is an ongoing creation together to get to a solution. Like that's what we're working toward. And sometimes that takes time. We and want you find to like if you keep building those skills and muscles, especially with the same team, the time it takes to come to solution gets much shorter, right? It's like you 100%. get a hundred percent. Yeah, you get a shorthand. Absolutely, you get. A but you have to do the work. You have to do the work first. You have to build the trust. Then you have to learn how to have to have conflict. I mean, that's Patrick Lencioni's organizational health. Like that's where you go, and and that's why conflict is so important because you can't do all the rest of it if you don't know how to fight through. Even what are our values? <laughs> like if you can't have those types of open conversations and time is sometimes what you need to do that. 
One of the missing resources, right? Exactly. Exactly. Time, money, people, and space. So then so we move on to the sixes. So Enneagram sixes um, fall into that dynamite category. They get very much like, oh, aren't you upset about this? You know, like they're, they're intensely um, with it because they're very in touch with their anxiety and they would like other people to match that intensity of anxiety. Like, aren't you upset about this? Can't you see this too? Uh, they, what is interesting about sixes is they can have almost like this it seems like a little Jekyll and Hyde happening for them because they'll be like, whatever the authority says, this is the rule. Okay. 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 But then all of a sudden that makes me anxious. So nope, I got I'm just going to make this decision. I'm just going to move over here and we're going to do this. And so they can quickly appease or they're going to push the whole time and feel like a rebel. And so one of the things that sixes do great in a conflict is they ask questions. Well, what about this? Well, what about this? What about this? One of the things that can be very frustrating for their conversational partners is that they ask questions. What about this? What about this? What about this? <laughs> and so that two-edged sword in a conflict can be challenging for the six. And so sixes to know about a six is that they are fiercely loyal. And all of those questions are coming from a place they want to make sure everybody is safe and secure. And knowing that is really helpful when you're like, this is the 82nd question I've got about this one thing. It's because it's coming from a place of they want context and they want everyone to feel safe. So for sixes to remember is that you are safe and secure and that you have good solutions. Like they have to remember that, but also to prioritize your questions. What, what's the, if I could only ask five questions, what's the most important one? Like if I got to answer that one, it would answer all these other little questions that I have. And that teaches this, teaches the six to really keep moving forward with what's the most important thing rather than getting caught up in all of this internal thought process. And for a person who is in conflict with a six to really say, I know these questions are important to you. They're not unimportant. However, X, Y, and Z, you know, like acknowledge that they genuinely are important, that they're important to us, but we need to get to this thing. Like, is there a way, you know, what's your most important question? Kind of lead them down that path is really important. Um, that's just a way to help the six work through the conflict and acknowledge their intensity about that. So that is, that's my sixes. I love the sixes. I of course, too. that's a strong wing for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but I do that the way you phrase that about if you can only ask five questions. And I just, you know, want to say that that is a powerful thing to ask in teams, too. So that and I ask it separately often, like just write them down, because it's so great when you find out like the top five questions, if we mm -hmm. pull them together, oftentimes they're very similar. And if we can get through those um people go, okay, I felt heard, you know, even if they, and also if you're a three and you want efficiency, it's only five questions I got to wade through. Exactly. It's like, exactly. I can last for five questions. Exactly. It's so good. So good. So so then we move, you. I know the seven. So the sevens fall into that silver linings group. They're like, oh, it's totally fine. There's no conflict here. Why don't we just do this? You know, and, and sometimes sevens don't realize that they are hurting other people when they move so quickly through those, when they're moving to the bright side so fast, they don't recognize all the time that they're hurting somebody in the interim, like feelings get hurt, ideas get squashed because they're looking at the big picture and brainstorming, not recognizing that other people aren't there yet. Like they're, they're not in that same place and not that that place is better, but it's just a different space to come from this idea of possibility or not wanting to experience discomfort from other people. So I want to make you happy. So you're stop being unhappy in my presence. So, well, at least <laughs> is something that a seven will often say. Um, so they can forget that the feelings of others and their own excitement or in their ability or their desire to get out of this. I like, I just, yeah. Sevens also deeply believe they can convince you. If I, I can convince you that this is the right way forward. And, and so when you're experiencing that from a seven, it's because they, they genuinely think I've, I can, I know that this is the greatest thing and I can woo you over to my side. And if I can't woo you, I can at least pester you to let me do it because I figured out why this is helpful for you as well. So 
when I had my first baby, I was going back to work and I was, um, I needed to figure out a time to be able to pump during the school day. I was nursing and the schedule, I had like six classes in a row. It was a crazy schedule. I had like four hours of straight teaching without any kind of break. And like, I couldn't do that with a newborn. And so I literally rearranged the whole school schedule so I could have a short break in the morning, lunch, short break in the afternoon. It cut my plan time into some really chunky bits, but it actually worked out better for a few other, um, other situations. And, um, because I could convince you, I could make this work. <laughs> and so that's the, the feeling from the seven. Um, what the seven has to remember is to really listen to other people because their ideas are coming so fast and so furious that the idea of listening to somebody else and adding to that cacophony can feel really overwhelming. So knowing that you have enough, that if you forget an idea, it's okay, it will come back or maybe someone else will offer it, you know, so slowing down and being okay with silence for others to process is huge for sevens in a conflict. Like just waiting in the silence. That's really hard for the seven, but in a conflict, it helps so much because it gives people that opportunity to keep talking and say, oh, here's what I think. And you start to create that workable togetherness rather than feeling ram ramrodded through or that this doesn't even exist. So for a seven, so we talked about like, if you shoot down, quote unquote, shoot down a different numbers idea there, they'll take it really personal. They'll feel hurt. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but for a seven, because you are this magnificent idea generator. Um, <laughs> well, really, I mean, there's an option here to be able to say, hmm, what else you got? Yeah. Right. Like yeah. that's pretty close. But what else do you have? Is yeah. that something a seven would hear willingly or would they go? I already gave you a bunch. I think most sevens would be like, OK, I don't have any more. Let's talk about these. Like they would feel heard because one of the things that will really rile up a seven, like this will really, if, if you poo poo their ideas, like if you're just being wet blanket, like this will never work and you don't even entertain the possibility for a hot second, that's really frustrating for a seven. Um, so giving them the opportunity to almost have that like, ah, no, I'm out of ideas for now. Okay, let's keep going. You know, like now let's talk about these ideas is really, really helpful for the seven. Yeah, it's powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and you can always come back. The door's not shut. Totally. Right? Oh, yeah. We're not done with this. We're just done with this for now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And tip to sevens, if you're trying to woo a five, just say, I know this will really work. No one else in history has ever done it. But you know what I'll do? <laughs> let me do it for a week and I'll keep some data for you. And then we can talk about it. Just let me pilot this. <laughs> totally. I guarantee you every single time I'm going, just a week? Okay, okay, let's do it, right? Let's do it. Yeah, and I'll come back with data. And here's the funny thing. Sevens actually really love data. Their ideas are rarely out of um, something that isn't going to work. They've made a pattern and um, they just might not have their handle on the quantitative data. <laughs> they can find it. <laughs> I'm sure they can. I love my sevens. Mm -hmm. um, actually, all the numbers bring so much richness to what, totally. what we do together, especially as teams, you know, mm -hmm. and... I just think that recognizing the differences, do you notice how I said, I just think because I don't feel it. I just think <laughs> um, little self-deprecating humor here, but honestly, that's true. But when we can pull the best from each other, it also encourages us to show up in conflict. It's like, this is not a dangerous place for me. Nine times out of 10, it's never been, but now I feel really uncomfortable in conflict. Can I trust that it's still the same place. Now, if it's not the same place, you don't want to be ignorant and just go, I'm going all in mm -hmm. um, because you can get hurt. You want to think about yeah. it, but to just give some, I guess, grace to your other team members and going, we're all new at this, or this is all, it's uncomfortable for all of us, but for different reasons. Yeah. I think one of the biggest things, if I can help, it doesn't matter what number you are, is that if you can get through the and just normalize that conflict is awkward, that it is messy in the middle. Like, okay, but that's where, that's where the magic happens. That's where we build connections. That's where we come up with the best ideas. That's where we build trust because I'm speaking to you in a way that is respectful, even though I'm frustrated, all of that, even though like, it kind of makes me go, <laughs> even though I know that it is true, if we can all just normalize that feeling that that doesn't mean it's bad. 
then we can all move forward in conflict. And that's kind of like any new thing or any new stretch we have to do in life, right? It all feels mm -hmm. a bit scary. And then you do it and you're going, okay, I lived through that. It wasn't that bad. And the next time it's still probably a little scary, but it's not as scary. Exactly. Exactly. So we can build our conflict chops. <laughs> um, so I, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about what's coming up for you that you're super excited about. I've got two more short questions for you, but I, I do want to know, I know you've got something coming up that's exciting. Yes. Yeah, so I'm doing some really fun conferences this year talking about self-awareness and burnout and conflict resolution and how that helps us as leaders. And I also have a TEDx coming up. So that's really exciting at McMaster University. So, and I'm talking about this idea that conflict is opportunity um, and how we, it's how we build relationships. So I'm really excited about that coming up. Sweet. That'll be a great conference. Yeah. Um, and you do have something our listeners can grab from your website, right? Absolutely. So I have a few things. If you go to jenwhitmer.com slash freebies, there is a 20 helpful phrases in difficult conversations freebie there. And what that is, it's just a download, but it, it breaks out some helpful scripts. I know for me, sometimes if you haven't figured it out, I talk really fast and I can get my words tripped up, especially when I'm nervous and I'm like, oh, that's not how I wanted to say it, or that wasn't the helpful way to say it. So if I can have a phrase to get myself started, it like uncements my tongue. That's what that um, that free download is. And so it's got different phrases for how to start a conversation, what to say in that middle, how do you end it well, and it's broken down into those three categories. Sweet. And then what I know you've given a you've given you have given a nice discount for folks who want to get your communication guide as well. Yes. So if you want that, once you get the freebie, you can grab it for $17. Um, normally it's $35 if you just buy it off my website, but that's what you can have. So, and that goes through the different Enneagram types and how they communicate, not just in conflict, but just in general and what's great about them and what each type can work on. So as a guide for yourself, but also, gosh, I know I'm in this, in this, you know, team with a five, how can I communicate better with the five? Um, and some things that will offer you for each type and how communication works in general, and then down into the Enneagram types. So that's really, uh, huge value that's a bonus for 17 <laughs> bucks just one 10 minutes of saving someone grief is worth that right there <laughs> totally uh, yeah absolutely um so i love this quote of yours that says if you avoid conflict you manufacture fake peace mm -hmm. so on that quote i ask you my last question which is if you were now going to sit down with your eight-year-old jen what would you tell her about the road ahead Oh, my word. If you avoid conflict, you manufacture fake peace. Eight-year-old Jen needs to know that just because people laugh doesn't mean the conflict is over. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's so great. Thanks, Jen, for know, being a guest. <laughs> yes, well, and we do, right? Mm -hmm. So Thank you so much for being a guest. I've so enjoyed both your energy, but you have shared so much wisdom and great value in this conversation that I can't thank you enough. Oh, well, thank you for having me. You've been listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, change agent, and strategic vision coach, Sarah Box. You can grab the show notes and find out how to work with Sarah at sarahbox.com forward slash no labels, no limits podcast. We'd love this podcast to reach as many people as possible. So please remember to rate, leave a five-star review and share the podcast with someone you think would get value from this conversation. Until next time, keep taking those daily action steps to align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and life.